The Schaefer Trail in Moab's Canyonlands is a thrilling way to experience the canyons and to get away from the crowds. If the weather's good and you have a decent SUV, it's something you must do. Moab, Utah is an outdoor lover's paradise. It's the home of Arches National Park and Canyonlands National Park, where there's river rafting, rock climbing, hiking, and mountain biking. When you need an easy day, there's great photography, history, and even nice restaurants and some nightlife. You can even have an off-road adventure in your own car. This is the Schaefer Trail, as seen from the neck in the Island of the Sky District of Canyonlands. The first drop descends about 1,100 feet in a series of switchbacks. And believe it or not, you can safely drive it in your own SUV. And that's just what we're about to do. To get there, take Highway 313 towards the Canyonland entrance. The trailhead is a couple of miles before the Island in the Sky Visitor Center. When the pavement ends, the road is still flat, as if to give you more time to get used to driving on the loose, sandy surface. Then there's an impressive overlook, just before the trail cuts into the cliff face. We recorded nearly the entire one and a half hour drive. And in order to show you as much of it as possible, I've sped up most of the driving footage. I did the trail a few years ago, and this time I didn't stop as often. I know it can look scary, but the road is surprisingly wide. It's even safe to pass. The first time I remember being, well, not really scared. Let's call it intimidated. The drop-off off the driver's window is about 1,100 feet, and it's very steep. But this time, before starting out, I did what is recommended. I checked on the trail's condition with the ranger at the visitor center. I learned that because the trail is so popular, the top portion is graded more often than it was in the past. The ranger actually said that the steep switchback section was the easiest part of the trip. I also grabbed a map. The dirt trail is 17 miles long. About halfway through, it changes names to the Potash Road. At the river, the trail joins the paved Highway 279 for several miles back to Moab. I've always done the trail in May, and it's always been dry. But after a rain, the trail may not be passable. The Canyonlands website has a road conditions page. Go to it before you head out. It has handy info, especially if you're new to this sort of thing. Scroll down to the Islands in the Sky section to check to see if there's any info on the Shaver Trail. As I write this, the Potash Road section is in rough shape, meaning that a passenger car might not be able to make it, making it even more important that you talk to a ranger before you head down. He may recommend that once you drive down, you just turn around and drive back up. But every time I've done it, it's been fine. The trail starts at about 5,900 feet. I've done the trail three times, twice in a two-wheel drive truck-based SUV, and once in a Subaru Forester. And every time I've done it, the road was fine. But late in the season, or after a rain, the road might be too rough for an SUV that was designed to do nothing more than go back and forth to a kale shop. From the trailhead at 5,920 feet above sea level, we'll drop about 1,900 feet before getting back to Moab. The trail drops gradually. Most of the ride is uneventful. You can hardly tell that you're descending until you get to a switchback. By the way, if you don't want to put wear and tear on your own vehicle, you can rent a 4x4 Jeep in Moab. This was originally a cattle trail. Local ranchers called the Schaefer Brothers built it about 100 years ago to get their cattle to market. It was expanded greatly in the 1940s when it was used by uranium prospectors. That's also when many of the roads on the canyon floor were cut. Many of these still scar the landscape. By the 50s, the Schaefer Trail was nearly forgotten. Like the rest of the area, it became a part of the National Park in 1964. The trail became popular only recently. In 1980, only 57,000 people visited all of Canyonlands. Today, nearly a million come every year. Though the view is amazing, the drive is remarkably normal. There's never an uh-oh moment, or even a slight slip of the wheels. After about 10 minutes, the initial ascent is about over. 
It was almost too quick, though I never got over 15 miles an hour. Here's what I said about it at the time. Well, that was it. That was pretty easy. We dropped 11 to 1,200 feet uh, in about 15 minutes at the most, it looks like. Didn't get a chance to look at the view. Basically, I'm looking at the road about 15 to 20 feet in front of me. It's pretty darn interesting, let me tell you. Thoroughly enjoying it. Mountain bikers from around the world come to Moab, and some even try to pedal up this road. As a cyclist myself, I ask if the rider needs food or water. It's over 90 degrees, and sometimes they just might need it. There are several connecting trails in the canyon. The longest is the White Rim Road. It's over 100 miles long, winding its way across the Caprock, often just a few feet from the canyons that are cut by the Colorado and Green Rivers, which are hundreds of feet below. The White Rim Road can be seen from many of Canyonland's viewpoints. Here it is from the Green River Overlook. There are few signs on the trail, but they do helpfully exist at this T intersection. The road ahead is the White Rim. The Schaefer Trail goes to the left. The ranger I talked to said the White Rim Trail was safe for two-wheel drive vehicles like mine up to Muscle Man Arch, whatever that is. He says you'll know it when you see it. Well, I decided to go exploring. Oddly, the White Rim rises slightly. This took a toll on a couple of cyclists. These were a part of a tour group with a support vehicle. Because I hadn't studied this part of the map, I was expecting the trail to be near the rim. It wasn't, and it became sandier. This is not a place to get stuck. The trail info sheet states that it's best to take enough food and water for a day or two in case you break down and have to be rescued. It also claims that towing charges could easily reach $1,000. At a wide spot in the road, next to the cyclist support vehicle, I decided to head back. I learned later that Muscle Man Arch was a further 40 minutes down the road. A mile or so later, I rejoined the Schaefer Trail. A wooden sign claims that it's 32 miles to Moab via the Potash Road. I've traveled about 8 miles so far, so the trail map, well, it's a bit misleading. A few hundred yards later, it starts to get rough. The path narrows and gets very rough as you descend into Schaefer Canyon. It's here that you realize why you need a high clearance vehicle. Going slow and dodging the largest of the sharp rocks is critical. It becomes evident that the ranger was right. The top section is the easy part. Then there's a fairly flat clearing with nice views. This is a great spot to take your time or even stop to enjoy the scenery. It gets rough again as you cross a wash. During a rain, this part can be treacherous or even impassable. The drive up is also a challenge. These motorcyclists asked me about the part I just drove down and they shared what was next for me. The trail is now on a broad shelf above the Colorado River. The cliffs rise 12 to 1500 feet and the view is amazing. It took 45 minutes to get here, including the White Rim excursion. From Dead Horse Point, high above, you can see this part of the road. This is the only overlook on the river, so it's worth spending some time exploring it and taking it all in. When Buzz Aldrin stepped on the moon, he described what he saw as magnificent desolation. I can think of no better way to describe this spot. It makes the rough ride well worth the effort. In the other direction, in the layers, you see millions of years of geology and earth history. A little farther down the road, a faded spur trail heads to the right and provides another view of the river. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I saw the spur trail from Dead Horse Point State Park the next day. Now that you know it's here, you should take it. From Dead Horse Point, you can see the next few miles of the road and a few more spur trails. By this time, the trail has changed names. It's now called the Potash Road, 
and a portion of the White Rim Road. The road meanders for several miles. By the way, we're no longer in Canyonlands National Park. In fact, we haven't been since just before the River Overlook. On some maps, the road even has a number. It's called County Road 142. When the landscape opens up, again, you get that feeling of magnificent desolation. It's another good spot to stop and take a few pictures. As you go over a crest, there's a brief hint of blue on the horizon. They are potash evaporation pools from a mining operation. They provide a few of the non-tourism related jobs in Moab. They also provide nice contrast to the landscape. The road ends down at river level, so there are still several hundred feet to drop. And drop it does. It was too rough for the stabilization system, so sorry for the bumps. There are other trails down here, and there are no signs, so it's easy to get a bit lost, especially when heading in the other direction. Telephone poles are a sign that it's almost over. There are only a few miles of dirt road left. There's one more interesting photo up just before leaving the dirt. This balanced rock is about the size of a small bungalow. When you hit the pavement, you're on Highway 279. It starts just after the boat dock on the Colorado River. Suddenly there's more greenery along the road. The Colorado is just to the right. Then there are great sandstone cliffs. This area is called Wall Street. Look for a sign pointing to Indian writing. Several feet above the road, in the dark desert varnish, the ancients left their mark. Most depict animals and those who hunted them. You may be wondering why they're so high off the ground. Well, the natural level of the dirt was below the area of the desert varnish. The dirt was removed when they built Highway 279. A little further down the road is the rock climbing area. This is the easy section, where local outfitters train first timers to climb these nearly vertical walls. It seems fitting to end a journey that began by descending a cliff by watching someone climb one. There are just a few more miles back to Moab, and this will give you plenty of time to reflect. In just a couple of hours, you've descended over 1,900 feet on a road that was carved into a cliff. You've spent time in a harsh, pristine, former ranch with 1,200 foot tall stone walls that were once used as a natural corral. You've seen how resources are mined. You've seen ancient writing. And you've seen how some cheat gravity. All in all, not a bad way to spend an hour and a half to three hours. 